earlier, one of the very clear trends in the world of work is the resulting expectation that every employee will take responsibility for managing their own career. This is a huge shift in just the past 30 years or less. Four, in this changing global marketplace, a thriving industry has sprung up of career counselors and career coaches who go largely unused. Out there in the workplace with no paternalistic employer at hand and no mentor available, the question confronting employees ill-fitted to manage their own career is, who can I turn to? The answer is career counselors, a vocation that was scarcely dreamed of just 30 years ago. But now we have a lot of them. In the U.S. at least, they are in every major city and many small villages as well. You go to them, you pay by the hour, just as you would a therapist, and get led through a process of career planning and decision making. This rise of career counseling is not simply a U.S. phenomenon. I maintain a website on the Internet and have been getting letters from all over the world, from South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, China, Germany, and so on and so forth, about how one gets trained to be a career counselor. In the U.S., the answer is it takes quite a number of years. Therefore, and not surprisingly, there has sprung up in the past four or five years a new profession called career coaches. Well, why not? We have long had paramedics and paralegals. Why not have paracounselors? And so we do men and women who, after merely one long weekend of training, are certified as qualified to aid individuals in their career planning and decision-making. In the career field, this is the fastest rising industry in the U.S. And yet, for all of that, the number among us who seek to take advantage of this resource is relatively minuscule. In the U.S., that number is surely only in the thousands out of a workforce that numbers 145 million. And what are the reasons for the failure to use this resource? Well, there are a lot of, first of all, a lot of employed and unemployed alike who are young enough to have never known a real recession. And this is no great burden, except that they lack perspective. They believe that what works now in good economic times will always work, even in bad times. Hence, if they are besieged by job offers now, they believe they will always be thus besieged. They see no need to take initiative about their careers. To illustrate this, in a posting found on Amazon.com, one writer claims that the natural state of things is, quote, being so much in demand that you are always getting feelers, so you never have to look for a job. That works a hundred percent of the time, unquote. He is not alone in this naive belief. The unspoken mantra of this school of thought is just be good at what you do and they will come. They, of course, are employers. Now, this may be true in these job hunters' lives, but why do they think it's true of everyone? 
This is a trend I like to call the universalization of one's own individual experience. It's born of a certain naivete, a certain lack of experience, and certainly a lack of perspective. But, back to their mantra. The question is, will they come? Will employers come after employees so that the latter never need to job hunt? Well, in an industry where there is a severe shortage of highly trained people, perhaps. But not in all industries, even in good times, and not in most industries when times turn bad, as they seem likely to do very shortly. It will become apparent very swiftly that in today's changing global marketplace, an individual is required to take the initiative if they wish to sustain their present job or ever find a new one. The second reason why the resource called career counselors or career coaches is so neglected is that there's a great resistance these days among unemployed and employed alike to the idea of spending large sums of their money to secure help that they think should be free. Spend your hard-earned wages for marriage counseling? Yes. For psychological problems? Of course. But for help with your career or with job hunting? Never. Besides, they say, there are cheaper alternatives to career counseling or career coaching readily available in local bookstores and on the Internet. In fact, there is in many countries a thriving industry of relatively inexpensive self-help books devoted to careers. How large an industry? Well, five years ago, Fortune magazine reported that between 1990 and 1996, some 3,100 non-fiction books about finding, managing, and changing careers were published in the U.S. And not merely published, but used. In a measure of how desperate job seekers are, for inexpensive help with their careers these days, one of these books alone, my own What Color Is Your Parachute, has been purchased and used by over six million people. Five, in this changing global marketplace, the Internet has come center stage for managing one's career, but with mixed results. I assume that some of you wonder why I've waited so long to cite the Internet. After all, it is the phenomenon of the changing global workplace in the last seven years. According to the World Almanac, three million people, most of them in the U.S., made use of the Internet back in 1994. By last year, <clears throat> that number had grown to 300 million. And since traffic on the Internet doubles every 9 to 12 months, it is estimated that by the year 2005, the number of people connected to the Internet worldwide will exceed 1 billion people. Given that kind of popularity, it would be astonishing if the Internet were not increasingly involved in people's careers. Yet, the actual statistics are surprising. These naturally vary widely depending on who is collecting them. But most studies agree that no more than 14% of all users of the Internet use it to help manage their career or their job hunt. Ergo, 86% of all users of the Internet never employ it in the service of their careers. This is widely divergent from the common perception that almost everyone these days 
is using the internet to help manage their career or when the occasion arises their job hunt what's going on well in order to understand this we must note that the internet offers five services to those who wanted to help manage their careers the internet offers first of all a place for employers who want to bring notices of their vacancies to the attention of a large number of job hunters all at one time it offers secondly a place for job hunters who want to broadcast their resume to a large number of employers all at one time it offers thirdly career advice plus career or personality tests often for free and it offers fourthly a way to research various careers fields industries companies and individual employers and finally it offers chat rooms and so forth to job hunters who want to discover far-flung contacts in new cities or even countries now for simplicity we may refer to these five uses of the internet vis-a-vis uh, -vis careers as job postings resumes advice research and contacts the thing is these five divide naturally into just two principal functions or groupings the first we may call job matching and the second we may call content job postings and resumes belong to the first advice research and contacts belong to the second this distinction between the use of the internet for job matching and the use of the internet for content is an important one the former has a relatively poor success rate while the latter is infinitely more useful poor success rate oh yes if we restrict our attention solely to the job matching function of the internet studies such as that conducted by Forrester research last April reveal that of those who use the job matching function of the internet only four percent actually find a job thereby in other words ninety six percent who seek to use the job matching function of the internet come up empty-handed if you are puzzled as to why this is so the answer turns on the fact that job hunters and employers prefer to use different methods for finding each other employers typically prefer promotion from within or use of personal contacts to locate new employees but job hunters typically prefer resumes the latter therefore dutifully post their resume on the internet but rarely ask themselves how many employers will come on site to look at my resume they just assume that the site where they choose to post their resume is employers favorite site to visit but typically this is just not true nowadays resume sites will rarely ever divulge their actual statistics but it was not always so as recently as January 1998 some sites were willing to tell all the monotonous results ran like this on one site that had 26,644 resumes only 41 employers looked in on that site during the previous 90 days on another site which had 40,000 resumes only 400 employers looked in on that site during the previous 90 days another site 85,000 resumes only 850 employers looked in during the previous 90 days still another site 59,283 resumes that only 1,366 employers 
looked at during the previous 90 days. Incidentally, this success rate of job matching on the Internet, 4%, is roughly equal to the success rate of job matching before the Internet came along. In other words, while in outward appearance the Internet looks like a new thing, underneath it's just the old job hunt in a new dress. It represents an alteration in form, but not in substance. Fortunately, that's not true of the other function of the Internet vis-a-vis uh, -vis careers, namely the content side. Here, the Internet has added an interesting new dimension to people's managing of their careers in both substance and form. People can now do things with respect to advice, research, and contacts that they never could do before. And we can expect to see an increasing emphasis on this use of the Internet as people become more and more jaundiced and disillusioned about the job matching side. Those of you familiar with the Internet will know that what all sites are looking for is stickiness, which means how long does a person typically hang around their site once they're connected to it. When it comes to career sites, job matching doesn't produce much stickiness content does. Currently, however, this trend is in its infancy. In fact, one large job site on the Internet hired their first content manager only last year. Still, if you want a trend to watch, notice in the days ahead how many more and more career sites will be emphasizing content. That is to say, advice and testing and research in particular. One such site, salary.com, which came out of the blue not terribly long ago, now dwarfs all other sites concerned with salary, some of which were around for ages. And what does this site have to offer? Content, research, information, advice. Job sites know how to read the writing on the wall. In the days ahead, particularly as the economy turns down, their mandate will be clear. Expand your content or die. Well, there you have the five trends that I believe are driving the career dynamics of this changing global marketplace. To recapitulate, they are, one, jobs are getting longer in the hours demanded, but not necessarily more satisfying. Two, jobs are not lasting as long, and this is regarded as a virtue. Three, employees are increasingly on their own so far as managing their career is concerned. Four, a thriving industry has sprung up of career counselors and career coaches who, however, go largely unused. And five, the Internet has come center stage for managing one's career, but with mixed results. Now, the question is, are these trends good or bad for productivity in business, education, and government? Well, it's a mixed bag, isn't it? If employees are working longer each day, productivity is, in theory, increasing because they're turning out more work. But if they're bone tired from the long hours, the quality of their work may suffer, thus lowering productivity. Again, if employees aren't staying in jobs as long as they used to, productivity is in theory increasing because they know more from having worked in so many places. But on the other hand, with endless turnover, organizations increasingly have lost their memory banks, essentially thus lowering productivity. 
again, if employees are having to take more initiative about managing and directing their own careers, productivity in theory should be increasing because they will make a better effort to match themselves to appropriate jobs. But if they were raised in a paternalistic atmosphere where people endlessly did things for them, they may fail to meet this challenge and just stop dead in their tracks, as it were, waiting for someone to come and rescue them from whatever vocational crisis they were facing at the moment, thus lowering productivity. Moreover, there aren't enough career counselors to bridge this gap and get employees moving again along an appropriate career path. And to turn to the last trend above, if employees have the internet at their disposal, productivity should increase because the internet increases their ability to access information when needed and to quickly establish connections with one other people all around the globe that in pre-internet days were possible only slowly or not at all. But on the other hand, the internet is often gangly and unwieldy and one can spend hours looking for information on the internet that could be found by one quick phone call to a friend. And this wasted time surely doesn't help productivity. Given that these trends are a mixed bag for productivity, whether in business or in education or in government, what can we as executives or directors of organizations do about this? Well, given my comments above, I think the prescription writes itself. One, we need to spend more time thinking how we can help employees deal with the tiredness engendered by long hours and how we can help them build a more balanced life instead of just letting their work consume their entire lives, their relationships, and their energies. Two, we need to spend more time thinking about how we can preserve the memory banks of an organization something along the lines of these are the problems we dealt with in the past and these are some of the strategies we developed for dealing with those problems. We need to be offering employees more training on site and during working hours about how to manage their life, identify their skills and so on. We need to teach them, for example, there are traditionally seven parts to a job or career. One's skills, one's field, the place where one works, the working conditions there, the kinds of people one is surrounded by, the values or goals one pursues there, and the salary. And we need to teach them that when they are unhappy in their job, the first question they must ask themselves is, which of these seven factors makes me most unhappy? We need to help them understand that skills are more than a matter of what information they have stored in their heads. We need to teach them that skills are a matter of what functions they do well and enjoy, like analyzing or organizing or writing or persuading or leading and the like. And we need to teach them how to identify exactly what skills they have and do best and most prefer using. Employees who are taught these things at work and subsequently take management of their own career are going to be the ones who survive best in the changing global marketplace that lies ahead and have the most loyalty to your organization and do their best to increase productivity while there. 
but we cannot expect them to pick up this information outside of work. We need to do more to make this a part of what they do at work. I reiterate, it is up to us as managers and executives to institute courses on the job that will teach our employees the importance of doing this and teach them how to do all this for themselves. And third, we need also to spend more time educating our employees about the disabilities of the Internet as well as its virtues. Everything has its limits. We know enough not to try to use our cell phones inside of certain buildings. We know enough not to try to use our flash cameras at night to photograph some dark object 200 feet away. But we do not spend enough time teaching our employees what the limitations of the Internet are, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the managing of their careers and the undertaking of a job hunt. I have a website up at www.jobhuntersbible.com which attempts to do that, but we need more of the same. All that I've said here about executives or directors applies, of course, to those of us who are employees or independent professionals. But we cannot depend on someone else to set up the program I have outlined above. We must take lots of initiative for ourselves to set up a balanced life, deal better with our own fatigue, keep good notes about our past challenges and solutions, and learn the limitations and not just the virtues of the Internet as a tool for career management. Personally, I think this is a thrilling time to be alive. Things are not what they used to be. Things are changing, and events have become unpredictable. There's a word for all of this in everyday life. It's called adventure. Human beings are never more alive than when they're in the midst of an adventure. And that surely is what we are in the midst of at this time in history. It is a great adventure, and it will summon us to greater life and greater liveliness if we use it aright. There's a great work to be done ahead of us. Let us roll up our sleeves and get on with it with great joy that we are called to be adventurers at such a time in history. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Now let us continue with our second question and answer session. And we're going to have our first question from Sania Internet in La Habana, Cuba. And the question, please. A greetings from Havana, Cuba. Currently in the first world countries, we are greeting you. With, with, this is the question. Currently in the first world countries, there is a great demand of skilled skilled workers who can work in things that have to do with IT, inter information technologies and communication technologies. How um, we need to, there are sound problems. Our question is, what strategy do you recommend the developing world countries to be able to catch up with the first world um, in this same demand? How, what, are, what is the relationship here? We had sound problems, so I am not sure that I got all the preliminary to the question. However, the question is the strategies. What strategies do you recommend for the developing world countries? Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, Dick. I'll, I'm going to come to you on this one about strategies for the development of skills in developing nations. Well, the main problem in developing nations is not so much the development of the skills, the, this is my view, <laughs> um, as it is holding on to those workers. And uh, this isn't just a problem of developing nations, it's a problem of villages in even uh, 
old established countries, how do they hold on to their citizens who tend to flee from that village and go to the big city and so on. And the only way I know to deal with that, the only strategy that I think works, is to talk to the people who are leaving or have left and find out what it is that is attracting them to go to the other place and, and learn how you can balance that with what it is you offer to the workers in the uh, developing countries to be able to continue training them and, and continue to hold on to them, which is the big question. Are there any good models, Dick? Have you seen anything in the world that we can relate to? I'm not that familiar with the models. All I know is that where the uh, places that are being left make some attempt to actually ask questions of the people who are leaving, uh, why are you leaving, it sometimes turns out to be nothing to do with the work. It turns out to be uh, some working condition or some living condition that is very important to them that they don't feel they can find where they are. And obviously that can be addressed if you know what it is that is causing them to move. Good. Thank you for an excellent question and, and the response to I'm going to take a question now from the Serviço Nacional de Aprendizem in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yes, sir. My name is Maria from Canaca, Brazil, and uh, we would like to make a question. But the question is, uh, we would like to know if the acceptance of the mistake as part of the learning process does end up generating a culture that the mistake is necessary for the result. Thank you. Uh, um, we had a wise and learned man who has since passed on here in the U.S. who used to say that uh, we are the only creature designed by our Creator to learn primarily through the making of mistakes. And I think that uh, honoring that idea, uh, he used to say, if in schools you want to give a high grade to somebody, it ought to be to the one who's made the most mistakes because they're the one that have learned the most. And Charles addressed that in his uh, comments earlier about the man who was rewarded. Uh, just because he had made a mistake, he was more valuable to the organization. And I do think that that obviously determines the culture as well, and the culture determines that. Charles, I'm going to let you follow up on this since you yeah, mentioned it specifically. I, I think this is really important. Uh, you only do learn through making mistakes. But the critical issue is not the making of the mistake <coughs> itself. I mean, you don't set out to make mistakes. The important thing is that you recognize, first of all, that you've made one. And then secondly, you take the time to say, what is it I've learned here as a result? So I think the trick is to not focus on the mistake, it's to focus on the learning. And the thing about doing things right is you haven't got much to learn. Uh, when you do things wrong, you've got the most to learn. I'd like to add something, if I may. Um, it said that some people have, say, 15 years' experience at work, and some people have one year's experience repeated 15 times. I think it's very important to profit from the mistake and move on to making new kinds of mistakes and not keep repeating the old ones. It, just a quick follow-up, is there a fear amongst workers on the whole that, that mistakes are, are forever? In other words, they cannot recover from them? Oh, I think there's a fear among human beings. Yeah. Uh, we're told as children, I know I was, that making mistakes is something we want to avoid. And you, 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 the whole aim of much of growth is supposed to be to teach you to avoid mistakes. And that's true. I mean, if you don't want people to walk out in front of cars. Right. You want them to learn that. Okay. Uh, but Very good. Let's, let's move on. Uh, thank you, Charles and, and Dick. The uh, next question comes to us from the Pontificia Universidad um, in Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican Republic. Given that the organizations must contribute to, for the employee to be able to attain, among others, more efficiency, identification, productivity, do you agree that units must be created to develop re human resources in the organizations. This is for Dr. Charles Brass. And for Dr. Bowl, uh, Richard, would you please tell us about the, um, the independent contracting and uh, that as a m an employment mechanism? And we have yet another question. Of the seven factors that you mentioned in order to be satisfied and to be productive at work, how many of those factors do you think, uh, when those are lacking, 
would create a crisis for the employee and how, how or which ones of those seven factors are considered the most important ones? In other words, which ones can you afford to not have or which ones can you afford, um, must you have before you have a crisis? In, in, in deference to some, some timing issues, Dick, if I can, I'd like you to address the last part of that question first on the, the, of the seven issues, which one are most important? Uh, every bit of research that I'm familiar with, at least in the U.S., suggests that it's the relationship with the boss, hence the uh, people that surround you, the, of the seven factors I named. It's the people that surround you that make the biggest difference in people staying or leaving. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, and, and I want to thank you for those questions, and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. Uh, we have reached the time in our program uh, where we have run out of time, and, and we hope that all of you have enjoyed participating once again in this exciting multilingual and multinational program. We invite you to participate in our second video conference of this year's series, which will air on March 1st, 2001, entitled Timeless Principles for Organizational Success, The Power of Wisdom and Human Values. For additional information on this year's video conference series, please consult your participants' manual where you will find the dates and specific topics for each program. You may also visit our websites, Intectra.com, OnlineCompetence.com, and DistanceEducatorInternational.com. On behalf of all of us who collaborate with the International Training Center, I thank you for your enthusiastic participation and interest in today's program. Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you soon.